But what I want to discuss with you is Shira Shirim. And we're going to talk about why we read it on Pesach. Some have the Minog, especially Sfaradim, of reading it every Shabbos. And we want to focus on certain aspects. I would call this class an introduction to Shira Shirim. Mm-hmm. So Shirim has eight chapters. I mean, it would be a lifelong project to go through all Shira Shirim and study it verse by verse. What we want to do is give at least a flavor, and then if we get a chance towards the end of the class to go through a few psukim and see some of the insights, some of the highlights, and some of the messages that we could take from those psukim. So what I have in front of you, if you have the handout, is from Elio Kitov. He died, I would say, I'm guessing about 25, maybe 30 years ago. You know, it's quite a while already. And uh, he has a particular niche that I don't think anyone ever filled. You know, in Torah learning and teaching and writing and publishing, everybody has to have their niche, you know, that which is unique to them. And I think he really carved out for himself a very unique niche. What he does is he goes through the Mardim and he integrates Midrashim, and various commentaries into a text in a very beautiful, modern, flowing Hebrew. And if you're ever interested, he has a piece which was not published in the Sefer Todah itself in the Hebrew version on Yom Yerushalayim. It's a beautiful piece. They left it out, but it was published in English. And if you ever get a chance, it's really worthwhile because, you know, we sometimes we're confused about what Yom Yushalayim is all about, the 28th of ER, and what significance it has. So I'm just mentioning that on the side. Now, what he does is, in a single paragraph, he might quote one, two, or even three sources without even telling you that he does, he just integrates them one into the other. It's a beautiful presentation. Now you have in front of you, I think approximately five pages photocopy. I'm not sure exactly how many. We're not gonna be able to go through them all one by one. So I'm gonna take a look. So. So what we'll try to do is, we're gonna try to highlight certain points and certain paragraphs. What I might recommend is that as we do so, because I like to give a a shear that's text oriented, that's just my style. If you can, with your eye, you know, follow me in the text, certain paragraphs I'll skip, but you'll see the major paragraphs. You'll see that the key number for today is the number five. Even though again, there are more than five chapters in Shira Shirim, but the number five is going, to, is going to symbolize, based on Midrashim, the five times in Jewish history that there was a unique relationship between Knesset Yisrael, the people of Israel, and the Rebbe Shalom and God. Because all of Shir Shirim, as you know, I don't have to tell you this, is a simile, it's a metaphor for the relationship between Knesset Yisrael and HaKadosh Baruch, in which case HaKadosh Baruch was called the Dod, the beloved husband, and Knesset Yisrael, the Raya. Raya means the beloved wife. And it's a marriage relationship. We're going to see later on in Mirza Hashem, not in the Sefer HaTodah, because I have many, many different texts that I want to cover with you today, again, depending on time. And those who came to my daf Yomishir today know that I'm not very good at time management, but we did cover one of that too. Is a combination of marriage and the relationship between Akarish Bok and Knesset Yisrael. Why is marriage, the relationship between a male and a female, a husband and a wife, why is that symbolic and metaphor of the relationship between Akarish Bok and Knesset Yisrael? There are deeper meanings we will cover just the surface if you want. Why Shira Shirim on Pesach? That's the first question that the Sefer Atodah addresses. 
And he tells us in his opening paragraph that there are those who read half of Shir Hashirim on the first night of Pesach, at the end of the conclusion of the first Seder, and the second half of Shir Hashirim on the second night of Pesach, obviously in Chutz Lamech. Here in Israel, he says, we read the entire Shir Hashirim after the Seder. Our Seder ended at 2.30 a.m. I don't know what time your Seder ended. No one was up to reading Shir Hashirim. But we have a minute that we read Shir Hashirim on Shabbos of Pesach. Normally, that would be on Cholomoy. In this case, this year, we don't have a Shabbos Cholomoy to Pesach. And since presumably we've already read Shir Hashirim on the first day of Pesach, Therefore, we're going to read Shir Hashir publicly as a community tomorrow, Hashem, which is the Shabbos of Pesach. And here we have an overlap of both Shabbos and Pesach. So what I'd like you to gain from this class today is tonight, as you light candles before sunset, have in mind that we are entering into a very unique Kiddush HaSayom, a sanctity that integrates two very unique sanctities, that of Shabbos and that of the seventh day of Pesach. And these two sanctities merge and integrate to form one whole. So we're looking for that point of overlap, that point of commonality, if you will, between Shabbos and Shvi Shal Pesach, the last day of Pesach. And if we can pinpoint that important Kedusha, that sanctity, which is the sanctity that overlaps both Shabbos and Shri Shal Pesach. Then when we enter into this day of Ritz Hashem in a few hours, we'll be uplifted by that powerful message. So why is it that there's a special relationship between Shir Hashirin and Chag HaMatzos, Chag HaPesach? In the case of Shavuos, we have Megillus Rus, very clear. Ruth Rus was, as you know, a convert. She was a Gioras. And all of Klal Yisrael entered into Gerus at the time of Matan Torah. It was a national conversion. All the laws of conversion we derive from Matan Torah. In the case of Sukkot, we read Koheles, probably because Sukkot is a time when we feel uplifted by Chag Asif. We've gathered together all the, the, uh, the produce. And now we need a serious, solid message, which Shlomo conveys in Koheles. That's far from the case in Shir Hashirim. Shir Hashirim is anything but a solemn, heavy message. On the contrary, Shir Hashirim is considered the song of Simcha, of great joy. It permeates throughout the entire work. And Chazal were very hesitant about Shir Hashirim. After all, on the surface of it, it looks, and it, if you translate it literally, as a love story. But Chazal say, and Rabbi Akiva was the one who really waved the flag and took us over the, over the uh, finish line, that Shir Hashirim is not only Kodesh, like all the other 23 books of Tanakh, but it's Kodesh Kadashim. It's the holiest of all the books. Mm-hmm. And we're gonna try to understand more. So having said that, let's go on to the Sefer Kodah, the connection between Shir Hashirim and Chag HaPesach. And if you take a look in the third paragraph, which is the end of the main section on top, he quotes the Mahs of Vitri, and that's on the tradition of Rashi. This was written by one of the students of Rashi. And he quotes the Pasuk, L'Susasi V'Rechvei Faro D'Misich Rayasi. And obviously, if we're focused on the chariots and the horses of Mitzrayim, of Paro, obviously that connects Shir Hashirim to Pesach. But once again, it seems not to be satisfying to the rational mind. The connection here seems so coincidental, almost superficial. Okay, you found one Pesach which mentions the horses of Paro and Mitzrayim. Therefore, I should be reading Shir Hashirim, this great song of songs on Chag Pesach. What's that all about? He quotes the czar in the end of that same paragraph that starts with the word Tam. And the czar writes that Shir Hashirim is kolel kol ha-Torah. What does that mean? 
I mean, we have 613 mitzvahs in the Torah. I couldn't even find one single mitzvah in Shira Shiri. In the case of Kohelas, there are a number of different mitzvahs. In the case of Rus, there are at least two or three different mitzvahs. In Shira Shira, I was hard pressed to find even one. And yet the Zohar claims that this book of Shira Shira combines and, and compromises the entire Torah. But I think what he has in mind is Zohar, if I can be bold enough to say so, since we're in the North and the author of the Zohar is not far from here, is that what he means is that the history of Klal is really a history which we would call in a fancy English word, a dialectic. It's all about the relationship in and out between Knesset Yisrael, the Kala, and HaKadosh Baruch the Dod. And the, that relationship has its ups and downs. You know, we love to think about those who have a marriage like the birds, you know, that like, like the top look, right? And it's always on and up. But marriage is not always so simple, as we all know. Mm -hmm. Probably everyone here would agree that there are ups and downs. In the marriage relationship, that covenant between HaKadosh Baruch and Knesset Yisrael, the ups and downs reflect to what's called Golos versus Binyan Beis HaMikdash. When the Beis HaMikdash is standing, as it stood for eight centuries plus another three, 30 years, we're talking about a situation of marriage. The Kruvim Amu Uravim Zebuzim. Klal Yisrael and HaKadosh Baruch the Dod are connected. But there are periods of goals. And here's where the number five is going to become critical. The Torah speaks about number one, the Golis Mitzrayim, which is indicated here in Shira Shirim. Number two, the Geula from Mitzrayim, the redemption. Not only that, but Mikol HaUmos. Shira Shirim includes references to the redemption from all the various exiles, of which there were four plus Mitzrayim is five. And Shira Shirim is kind of Sibri Yitzis Mitzrayim. Why? Because Maskil Begnus from Mitzrayim Shvach, Shira Shirim starts with Golos Mitzrayim, like we start on the night of Pesach. Let's reflect the sheet of Shmuel for a moment. Mitchil Avadim Ayinu Lefar Mitzrayim. We were slaves, we were enslaved in Mitzrayim. That was the essence of Golos Mitzrayim. That's the Maskil Begnus. And if we appreciate what Gnus, what Shimud Le Mitzrayim was, then we can appreciate what Geula is, Messiah and Bishvah. And both these elements are manifest in Shir Hashim, and therefore Shir Hashim is very appropriate as a kind of extension of the Mitzvah Sipur Yitzis Mitzrayim. Now, all of you are probably thinking, I'm not a mind reader, but I can imagine you're thinking, wait a minute, Sipur Yitzis Mitzrayim is a Mitzvah that's limited in time. Does it extend over the entire Pesach? Yes, no, maybe. When is the mitzvah of Sipri Yitzis Mitzrayim? Anybody? On the night of the Seder, correct? It's only those 12 hours. Achibot, Talmideim, and they told him, he gives man the Kriyas Mashal Shachas. Genukshay, you fulfill the mitzvah of Sipri Yitzis Mitzrayim. It's enough. But the answer is, that Sipri Yitzis Mitzrayim is really a mitzvah that starts and is most intense and most obligatory on the first night, but extends throughout the entire night. And how do I know this? Because the Torah connects Matzah with Yitzis Mitzrayim. Bavur Zeh. The mitzvah of Sipri Yitzrayim is to tell the story with Matzah. And the mitzvah of Matzah applies for seven days. Shiva Sikami Matzah's Tocheli. For seven days we eat Matzah. In fact, the Vilna Gon, and it comes way before the Vilna Gon, the Pizkuni, one of the Chachme Ashkenaz, at the time the Bali Atos already writes, that for seven days we get a mitzvah of eating matzah. So that when we eat here in this beautiful hotel setting, we should have the possibility of eating matzah. I mean, I don't know, a lot of people feel, why waste my stomach space in matzah? There's so much good food here. But if you can add matzah to the equation, then you have a mitzvah of Sipri Yitzis Mitzrayim. And Shira Shiri is one level up on Sipri Yitzis Mitzrayim. Why is the number five so significant in Shira Shiri? He says the following, that with regard to Shlomo HaMelech, Shlomo HaMelech on five different occasions in his lifetime had what we called an aliyah. Aliyah means an ascent. He went up, up, and up. 
once, and these are all pursuits which you'll see on the bottom of your page one of the first page that you have in Sefer Malachim Aleph, the Givon Nirea Hashem El Shlomo, God appears to Shlomo in a place called Givon, and that's the first time that Shlomo Melch reaches the level of Nevoah, of prophecy with the divine revelation. Then Vayitain Elokim Chachmo Shlomo. And the, the Tanakh describes the wisdom of Shlomo. The wisdom of Shlomo is unique. No one could compare in his wisdom, not even Moshe Rabbeinu, to the wisdom of Shlomo. So that's the second ascent of Shlomo Melech. Then in the bottom paragraph on your first page, Shlomo Melch at this point is the personification, the embodiment of all of Knesset Yisrael. And the Migdash, which Shlomo Melch builds, represents Shlomo Melch achieving the ultimate level, the level of the Shachanti Besocha, of a marriage relationship between Knesset Yisrael and HaKadosh Baruch. And the Pasuk in Divrei Yomim, which is quoted all over Shas, HaKol B'chsav Miyad Hashem, Elias skill that even the Malachi Asharis looked down from the Shemayim and they saw the exact measurements where everything in the Migdash had to be located. And we discussed this yesterday. We touched on the tip of the iceberg exactly whether today we would know where to locate the Mizbeach. But this is all Kimo Maise Shemayim Varetz. It's unbelievable. The base of Migdash down in this world it's a microcosm. It's almost a mirror reflection of Shemayim, of the upper spheres. Again, this is something that's uh, a little bit beyond that comprehension. It belongs to the world of Kabbalah, of mysticism. And then if you turn to the second page, it says that Now here, the Medrash is very curious about Shlomo Melch lifting up his hands, Hashomai. What does that mean, Hashomai? It should have said, Shomai Ma. What's Hashomai? He lifted his hands, or he spread his hands, Hashomai. And Chazal said that what that means is, that the same HaKadosh Baruch, that same divine being that revealed himself back in Givon, now reveals himself to Shlomo Miller on the very day that he builds the Beis HaMikdash. And what's the significance of the number five? And the answer is, maybe we'll close the door at this point. I don't think we're expecting anyone else to join us. Chamesh Vekios, this is on the fourth line on page two, for those who like to follow the text. Shall Knesset Yisrael Bashem Elke Yisrael. There are five different levels and five different historical periods of Vekus, of closeness, of intimacy between Klal Yisrael, Knesset Yisrael, and Akarish. The first of the five. Vechas Hanan. Esa oil, esa moid, who kvod Hashem malas hamishan. The Torah describes towards the end of Sefer Shmos that the cloud, the glory of cloud, cloud of glory, Kadosh Baruch Hu, appears and fills up the Mishkan. And at that point, Hakadosh Baruch Kaviyachol leaves all the entourages of angelic celestial beings up in Shemayim. The Asalo Dira Batakto, that phrase is so profound. And Akash Bakhu could have easily remained Kaviochal in the upper spheres. The Balikabol say there are seven different Zvulos, different worlds, but yet Akash Bakhu desired to create a Dira to live down on this earth. And that was the mission. Number two. At some point in time, during the period of the first Migdash, which stood for 410 years, the intensity of the Shekhinah, 
of the divine manifestation in the Mishka was so profound that the Kohanim couldn't do the Avoda. They were so overwhelmed. And that's perhaps higher level in the relationship between the people of Israel and HaKadosh Baruch Lishis. This is already the second base of Mishka that was built by Ezra and Nehemiah. And that period of time of 420 years is divided into two. The first period of time is up to the Yavanim, until the Greeks came in and they defiled the Beis Hamikdash. And Chazal identified that defilement as a kind of a churman, as if the Migdash was destroyed. When the Hashem took over the Migdash, they purified the Migdash. It was like rebuilding the Migdash. So the Migdash Shane period of 420 is divided now into two different periods. So we have the bias of Ezra, Till Yivanim, now we have we have the fourth epoch, and that is after the Chashmonoim. From the time of the Chashmonoim, the Beis Hamikdash stood for two centuries, and then we were exiled, and the Roman exile still exists even today. So we have four periods of time. What's the fifth? We can all guess the fifth. The fifth is Beis Olamim. Sha'asid libana We'll have the eternal base on Big Gosh, and that'll be the fifth period of time. And that is the period in which Shira Shira reaches its climax, its apex. It is now a total relationship, a shlemus that's eternal in the relationship between Kalal Yisrael, the Kala, the Raya, and, and Akarish Baruch, the Dod, the beloved husband. So, five times, five different levels increasing, becoming more and more profound and intimate in the Dvekus relationship between the Dodo and the Raya. Now, it's very interesting that the Drashim actually pinpoint these five different periods in five different psukim that appear in these five chapters, respectively, of Shira. In the first chapter, we have what's called Ben Habadim. The Shechina during the time of the Beis HaMikdash, came through a place called Ben Abad, the Arna Abris, the Edus, Arna Edus, which contained the Luchos, had two poles that we used to carry the Aron, and the Aron was situated in the Kodesh HaKadoshim, and the Shekhinah would come down between the Badim, and my Badim, and here I'm talking to the women, I think maybe appreciate this more than the men, but in the symbolism, the metaphor of Shira Shira, where is Ben Abadi? Srar Hamar Dodi Li, Ben Shaddai Yoli. As I'll say that the Ben Shaddai might be a reference to Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron Cohen, but this is the of intimacy, which is considered reflection of the first of the five songs, if we count the five debates, relationship, and that's considered the Tzrar Hamar. The word Mar is a reference to fragrance. Something that has a fragrant odor is called Mar. That's why the place on which the Migdash is, is built, the mountain is called Har Hamoriah, from the word Mar. That fragrance represents the close intimacy between the Dod and the Raya. In fact, all of Megillah's Esther, in a certain sense, as we'll learn later, is very similar to Shira Shiri for two reasons. First of all, let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask as a, as a question that's almost rhetorical because we all it. How many times does the name of God appear in Shira Shiri? Zippo. How many times does the name of God appear in Megillus Esther? None. In fact, in one puzzle, there is a what's called a kinui. How do you translate it into English? Nickname. Nickname. There's a more sophisticated word than nickname. A pseudonym. Okay. Okay. I haven't mind the word, but I don't have a thesis, so it doesn't matter. There's one word in, in Megillah Esther which symbolizes God Himself. Amelah. Well, no, no. So that's Al Pikabol, but I'm saying Al Pipshat. Just Al Pipshat. It says that when Mordechai came to try to convince 
Esther, it says, Revach v'hatzot yamu al-Yehudim mi mokom. The word mokom is a reference to Almighty God. In Shir Hashirim, we have absolutely no reference to Almighty God. And that's why Shirim, paradoxically, is even holier than Megillah Sesta. Now, if you would have asked me, wake me up in the night, I would have said, you want to find the holiest of the 24 books? Find that one book where the name of God appears more often than in any other book. And that book wins prize and, you know, hits that red bell on top, call it the book. Paradoxically, the opposite. Almost, we're we're all zero. Yeah. Unbelievable. Where the name of God does appear at all, that becomes the holiest of all books, mm -hmm. which makes your stream even holier than the Gilus Esther. But getting back to the Mar, that beautiful fragrance, where do I find the word Mar in Megillus Esther? Mordechai. The word Mordechai, the name Mordechai comes from the word Mar, Majra, which is a very beautiful fragrance, a wonderful fragrance. It's even better than Dan, I guess. And uh, that's uh, Mordechai. And Mordechai, together with Esther, form a union that represents that fragrance. And if you'll be with me here for a shir, I'm supposed to give some time on Shabbos, I don't know when. I think it's in the afternoon. About Eretz Yisrael. We're going to talk about the land of Israel, land of Mar, as a land of fragrance. That fragrance represents the relationship between the Dod and the Raya. Okay. Now, to Shir Shir. So we have Bar Hamar Dodi Li, and now we have small tachas l'roshivi, we know, tichab kate. It's interesting. Why is, why is Admiral Kedusha getting no mention of Hashem's name at all? I'm hoping that we'll get to that before the okay. end of the Shir. So I hope the bell will ring and I won't get a chance. But in this case, I really mean it. You know, I, I hope we'll get to it before the end of the sheet. Okay. Oh, what? Wow. Press for time? I think we have another half hour. No? Okay, good. So here we talk about the no tichab kene, right hand. The right hand is always considered the more powerful hand. And this is in the second of the five chapters, first five chapters of Shir Shirim. And now we are leaving the Mishkan behind us, and we're up to level number two. That's already the base Hamigdash built by Shlomo. And then we get to the third level. That's Migdash Shani, the second base. And that already reaches a higher level, which is called the level of Ahavan Nafshi. What's fascinating is that according to this we're building up from Bay Rishon to Bay Shani. Now, if anybody knows a sugi at the end of the second paragraph of Sefta Yoma, there were five things in Rishon that were absent by Shani. One of them, for example, was the Aram. The Aram Bris Hashem was already Begniza. I have to call upon the Raiders to find it. But in the second base, I think there's a Shmina Shamayim. There were five that came down from heaven to burn the carbonus. There were no miracles in the second Midrash. But paradoxically, the Midrash sees in the second base a greater sanctity than that of the first. And that's reflected in Pesach at the end of Tanakh in Chagai. It says, Godol ha'achro minarishon. The last of the two Bote Migodos supersedes the greatness that of the Rishon. And nobody knows why. It's a pill. But if we ever figure out why Shira Shirim is Kodesh Kadoshim, then we'll begin to understand why Bayes Shady is greater than Bayes Rishon. Next, we go on. Bosi Lugania Chosi Kala. And now we're up to the second half of Bayes Shady. That's the Hashmonoim period and beyond, two centuries. And that's Second half of Bayes Rishon. Did I say Bayes Rishon? Cross that out. I meant Bayes Shani. Right? The Yavonim came in middle after 220 years of Bayes Shani. And the Yavonim defiled the Heichal. It was like Churban Amayis. 
And who rebuilt the Beis Hamikdash, so to speak? Chashmonoim. So from the Chashmonoim, we have number four, level number four, and that's indicated by the pasuk Achos Allah. So Allah, even a greater relationship. You know what? Let me give a marshal. Supposing Chas v'Shalom, a couple has act, you know, and they separate. When they get together again, it's an even more intense love than it was before. That's the marshal that I would give for you to when we got to the point of defilement and now we repurified the base. And finally, we get to level number five. This is the level of Baishlichi. She wanted to marry her menu that will be the Olavad. And that's considered small tachas roshivi minokti chabkemi. Here the Yemin is even more active. It's a chibuk. It's actually an embrace. And osid libanos below yicharev odli olam. And he quotes a very famous pasuk in Tehillim of the waters that will never be able to extinguish the fire of Av. It's Shir Hashirim, I'm sorry. And Shir Hashirim represents this great level of the Av, of the love that can never be, that can never be destroyed. Achasi towards the bottom of your page. What's unique about Megillah Shir Shirim, we call Kisra Kodesh, Shemba Kar, doesn't mention Hashem's name, even Bikinu. Suno name we called it? Okay, there's another word I'm looking for, but I, I can't remember. So that's as opposed to Megillah. Okay. Fine. Okay, there's a lot here. Let's just sort of fast forward a little bit because. As my wife points out very well, we are pressed for time. Okay. So again, all the books of the of the Holy Rim, 23 out of 4, are considered Kodesh. This one, the 24th, is considered Kodesh Kadoshim. Kishizocha Adam. So if you're on, I think it would be page uh, 3, if we had numbers here, on line number 5. From the top, This is an amazing statement. He says the following. Let's take all of Kisak Kodesh, 23 out of four books, and put it on one side the scale. And put Shir Ashir, Kodesh Kadashim, on the other side of the scale. All of the books of the Torah represent pure Kedusha. What does that mean, pure Kedusha? Not Kodesh Kadashim, but pure Kedusha. Pure Kedusha, as I'll say, Kol Mokam She Nemerba Geder Kedusha Nemerba Geder Prisha. Prisha means that we separate ourselves from the pleasures of this world. We climb above one level, one notch, spiritually elevated above the physical pleasures of this world. In physical pleasures, I mean an entire gamut of kinds of desires. For example, we live in a modern society where everything is about making money. Some people say that even what well, on during the corona period and different things that were going on, it was also about money making. But there are people who live their lives completely involved around money. That's also a kind of type of kind of desire. And then, of course, we have other kinds of types. We have Achilu and Shasiyah. person wants to eat more and more gluttonously. We have Tivus Niuf, which means the area of immorality, of, of intimacy. These are various types, various desires that we have. And the idea of the Torah is Kedusha rise above that level. But then there's a level even above that level. And that's called Kodesh Kodesh. That's the level of Shir Hashir. And he describes it beautifully. He says, Ovel v'shote, v'tai v'nene, ose erech eretz u'mes'ai, e'el poresh michol dover amutam. In the Kabbalistic works, this is called Klipas Noga. Noga, if I can give a, a, an example, would be something that's powerful. It's not milchitz, it's not flacious, it's not evil, and it's not pure good. It's really an amorphous whole. It's something that doesn't have a definite form. 
you decide with your Kalim whether you want to take from this Klipas Noga a Kedusha level or the opposite. And that's what Shira Shira about. Shira Shira challenges us with the greatest of all challenges that a person through his entire life, with every action, with every involvement, without running away from this world, is Hashrina Shore Bechol Masa. We begin to get a picture of why the no mention of the name of God in Shira Shira. Because once you know God, you're introducing Hakadosh Baruch Hu of Hakadosh. Why is God called Hakadosh? He is the total, in a sense, the personification of because he has no desires whatsoever. He has no physical body. He's endless. He's infinite. And in that sense, once you introduce Almighty God into the equation, you're introducing Kedusha. But Shira Shirim is all about physicality. It's all about this world. It's not about Kodesh. It's about taking this world, embracing it. It's about taking every challenge and every experience, every encounter in life, and elevating it to the level of Shrina. Like, for example, Chazal say that if you take the word for a man and take the word for a woman, the word for a man in Tanakh is Ish, and the word for a woman is Isha. So Ish has a Yud, Isha has no Yud. Isha has a He, and Ish has no He. If you take the two together, you have a Yud and a He, which is the name of God. Chazal say, Zahu Shechina Shreem The Balatanya, who was the founder of Lubavitch of Chassidus, writes Igeras HaKodesh, in which he speaks about intimacy between a husband and wife reaching a level of Kedusha. It's such a love relationship that it's like the love relationship between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Knesset Yisrael. It's pure love. And he's following. Take the Aron, for example. The Aron, which housed the Luchos HaBris, who's made of Ace. Ubadov, and the poles that we used to carry the Aron, Naseh, it became a house, a, a, a resting place, a domicile for a Kashbar who lives in all world. And as we said before, God desired to be to be kovea, to, to set up his dira betachton. And, and we're making something out of wood, and God is there, the shechina, kaviyoch, between the two poles of wood. And therefore, if Shra Shirim represents Ikar Shrina Betachtonin, that the Shrina is down here in this physical world, Bein Abad, made of apes, then it's Kodesh Kadosh. It's the highest level of Kedusha because it represents HaKadosh Baruch Hu permeating and penetrating into every dimension, every aspect of our life. And he goes on to mention that any actions involved, that man gets involved in in Olam Azeh, normally, if a person cannot reach that level of shira shira, once he gets too involved, we call it orangutan in Yishik, becomes almost obsessed. It's meant, because of its very power of physicality, to separate man from God. And that's not a good thing. So they rove tovas she he enjoys the benefit of this world to a great extent. And therefore he is, so to speak, Distance from God. Come Shira Shira to teach us that Chizoch Adam Lahalos Gam Os Isa. If he can upgrade and elevate even that action, where he has so much pleasure from that action, but he nevertheless elevates it. Is who you have veal it vacus fellow Kim Khan. That brings him to an intimacy of clinging and closeness with El Kim Khan. Now notice the word Chaim, because Chaim represents. The ultimate existence, that's God. That's called Elohim Chaim. But we can imitate God, and we can become like God, and we can also achieve Chaim. And that's what Shira Shirim is all about. Shira Shirim is all about Chaim. Chaim in such a way that there's no contradiction, no conflict between our everyday activities and everything we get involved with, and the Holy of Holies, and the Shechina, to take every action and elevate it. And therefore, Shira Shirim, is considered Kodesh Kadosh. It's built on the level, on the great love between the Dod and the right, and it's so powerful and so intense. Uh, uh, it's like what you said, the second base on Mikvah is the second part. 
is more holy or more special, they didn't have all those Nisim. Correct. Because they didn't have the Nisim, they had to have more input from the people, the more effort to be put in, the more uh, the person okay, that's works on it, maybe there's more Kedusha. Okay, you don't have Hashem permeating the same thing. So the more like you put in, the more you take the mundane and elevate it to the face that challenge the without the that's revelation. The so, like if we were all standing at the Dead Sea and saw the Nisim, like it would, it would be much easier. To I will the Red Sea. I don't know. I'm not sure what you'll find. Sorry, the Red Sea. The Red Sea. Although Dead Sea is also a good example of this. Reed. Sea of reeds. Okay. Now. To another point, here. do you remember the phrase in Hazal that Ha'or Hachi Gadol Bokeh Derech Hachoshe, which means if this room was in pure darkness, according to the spiritual understanding of Hazal, I'm not talking in physics now, if you light a light, that light is even more, it permeates, it's even more profound and intense than the light that we see here during during the light of the day. So that in Bayashemi, which is typically a period of darkness in Jewish history, and we can talk about that at great length, is therefore the R of Bayashene. And that brings us back to a discussion about Hanukkah, is even more profound than the R of Bayes Rishon, because Bayes Rishon was clear. It was Malochal Aretz Kvot. But Bayashene represents what we call Aye Makom Kvot. Where is that Kodesh If you see that middle paragraph, Shir Hashim Pesach, you have that? He says, Shir Hashim Ulevayar Kol and Yoni HaOlam Azzeh. Rak Moshe, Lohovin HaAva Atzrich Al Hashem Yisro. Vezeh Pirush Shir Hashim, Shemikol HaShirim Shemba'olam Yotzei Shir Zeh. It's unbelievable. All the songs and praises to God are all inherent in this book of Shir Hashirim. And therefore, Pesach, which is called Manche Rusenu, is the celebration of that love relationship. Akashbach reveals a great light on the first night of Pesach. And you should know that that great light is more intense than it comes straight from Shemayim. I mean, we, we really were on a low level spiritually at that point. Chazal in the Zohar compares to the Mentes Shari Tuma, we're on the lowest level of contamination. And there was no way that Hashem could reveal himself to us, but he did it b'chesed in a revelation that is so intense that represents the ultimate. And now, after the first night of Pesach, then we have to build up, you know, with our own, what's called Sarusa de our own building that Charlie you were referring to before, to now work on ourselves and create Kalim and transform ourselves in such a way that we can receive the Torah the end of this seven-day period. Now, as I said at the outset, I have a lot to talk to you about, but I want to focus on a few sukim in, in Shir Hashim. And I apologize for these are pages and pages and pages which I couldn't photocopy. What I have here is about five, six pages from a 200-page work. It's a, this is a translation from the Hebrew of the Nitzivmi Balaj, the great Rosh Hashiva in Volusion, and everyone's familiar with his commentary on the Torah, which is called Hakdovah. This is his commentary on Shir Hashiv, hundreds of pages. So I'm just going to call your attention to, again, for this class, really, I, I sh again, I'm just not familiar with the technicalities here, but I would have asked you to bring in a Shir Hashirim, the text of the Shir Hashirim, which is published in every Chumash, so that you have it inside, but you'll, you'll probably find that it rings a familiar bell. So in the first chapter of Shira Shirim, it says the following. In lote de ilach hayafab hashim, se ilach be ikve son. Now I can only tell you this on a simple level, and I'm telling you very little because I really don't understand this possibly before that it's it. Lote de ilach indicates that there's something that defies our understanding. We're confused about something. Lo te di lach. Lach is a reference to the kal, to the raya, that's Knesset Shul, and there's something that we're missing. 
a piece of the puzzle. And then the dog turns to the writer and he says, well, if you don't understand and you don't know the answer to your question, then se'ilach be'ikveyat song. Now the song representing the flock of sheep, which are shepherded by a shepherd, right? And they sort of take you off the road, right? Because, you know, we go down a certain path and the ikve atzon take us off path. So let me read to you what the Nitzim has to say about this. He says that Klal Yisrael are asking the following question. Hashem, you have sent us off the beaten path. And you've expelled us from the land and we're dispersed in the gulfs. He says, the people are confused about is we don't have the merit in Chutzar, it's in gulfs to deserve divine protection. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to get sort of we now in exile. And we look at the other nations of the world. And wherever we are, we're impressed by them. And we become part of their culture. We become influenced by their culture. Now, the nations of the world, says the Mitzvah, are not governed by divine providence. They live according to the dictates of nature. And now it's a that the one who is asking this question and giving the answer is none other than Moshe Rabbeinu. So this whole puzzle is symbolically a conversation between Moshe Rabbeinu and Knetra. Moshe Rabbeinu knew that God did not want Israel to assimilate herself, but wanted Israel to remain apart, even in exile. So Moshe Rabbeinu asks the, the impossible question. Why should we remain separate from the nations? What's going to protect us? What merits do we have to provide for Israel's needs when dispersed amongst the nations? Here's the answer based on Ruach Kodesh. In lo teidilach hayafav anashim, se'ilach be'ikve atzom, ure'iyas gidi osayach al mishin osarim, I'll translate it to English. If you do not understand, who you are. You are the fairest women. Go out and follow those who are in the footsteps of the sheep and pass your flocks where the shepherds gather. Say Chazal, what is the area where the shepherds gather? What is the symbolism? What is the metaphor? The measure says in Shirim, the Nevin, are those who petition God on behalf of Klali's they are the ones who have the power of tefillah because they have this close, intimate relationship because God reveals himself to the Nevi'im. Therefore, they will come and pray on behalf of Kali's. And therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu, as the Adon HaNevi'im, he's the father of all prophets, he is going to be the one who, on behalf of the fairest of women, right, Hayafab HaNashim, who's going to pray on behalf of the people of Israel. By the way, this is a very fascinating concept that Nitzim is touching on. The power of a leader to pray on behalf of the flock and to protect the flock. And we find this throughout the entire career of Moshe Rabbeinu. He's always there to protect the flock with his tefillah, with his prayer. So therefore, if you do not understand yourself, you wonder how Israel shall merit sustenance from the divine being. You might ask the following question, what about sacrifice? We don't have karmanot. When Avram Avinu said, eda ki how do I know that my children will inherit the land? That Kodesh Baruch Hu told him the karmanot. That's what the Brisbane of Asarim is all in Parshas Lechel. But we are now in exile. We don't have the answer of Akadosh Baruch to Avram Avinu. We don't have the karmanot. But Hashem says, Se'ilach be'ikve atzom, follow in the footsteps of the shepherds. These are the Nevi'im. The whole purpose of the sacrifice is to bring atonement, to get closer to Hashem, to improve. Well, first and foremost, the Nevi'im fulfill that function. Their, their responsibility is to uplift us to a level so we can achieve kapara, 
so we can achieve atonement. And secondly, every car one had to be accompanied by a prayer. It's a big chiddush. I never knew this. He says, even when Cain Vehevel for the very first sacrifices, they prayed to Hashem and asked Hashem to accept the sacrifices and grant them atonement. He goes on to say the Nitzu that the Psukim of David Melch indicate that prayer is the soul of man. And the Torah says in Mesech the Tainis that all of us tzibur were accompanied by prayers. And who were the prayer? Who was in charge of praying? It was the Kohen. The Kohenim and the Mishmeres Kahuna who were on duty, they would offer these prayers. But then the Nitzu says something unbelievable. He says also, who are these Ikvayas Who are these shepherds? They're not only the Nevi'im. They're not only the prophets whose prayers are accepted like the, that, like the sacrifice, like the Korbanos. He says we still need to, but that's not enough. What we need now is we need the scholars of the Torah. Those who study Torah day and night and the Gemal us that those who study Torah day and night actually offer a prayer. And the Gemara quotes a pasuk, that the Kumi Roni Balayla rise up and sing praises to God at night is actually the scholars who pray, excuse me, who study Torah at night. The study of the scholars day and night, especially at night, form a prayer to HaKadosh Bar. So if you want to know how we merit divine protection, even in the exile, the answer is, says in it's it, to study Torah day and night. And as soon as I read this, I thought, you know, the Minog was in the Nitziv, in Balashen, that there was always Torah being learned 24-7. There was a rotation system, and there was never a moment of time when they weren't learning Torah. He goes on to say that we are still confused despite this answer. Why? Because we no longer have the ability to dedicate ourselves to study of the Torah day and night. We're out there working in the fields. How could we guarantee divine sustenance during this long period of exile when we're not there in the study of the Torah? And he says that the Roim, the shepherds here, represent those unique scholars who are totally dedicated to the study of Torah day and night. We have to just connect ourselves to them. And by doing so, we are to guarantee divine protection. Now, what I have here is the parsha that we read on the first night of Pesach, which comes from Parshas Kisovo, which is called Arami Ovedov, which is the backbone of Arahagod. Now, in this Parsha, it says that we have to bring up Bikurim, and we have to recite what's called Nikra Bikurim, which is a capital review of all of his Mitzrayim. And then immediately we have something called Vidui Masros. And that means that we have to take out Astros, make sure that they would be shown as to give the Levi and my sir, Ani to the Aniam, etc., etc. And then within the cycle, we have something called Beer Maestros. And the Mishnah, the Maestros calls it Vidui. Now, Vidui, we know is confession. Let's read the confession that we recite at the moment of Vidu Masras. The Torah says, Ki sechalel aseres kol masar to aschav ashanashis. So every year is the moment of Vidu Masar. We'll take out all that. We do it again three years later at the end of the sixth year. And the Amartal Lefnei Hashem Alokecha. Here's what we recite in front of God. Biarti HaKodesh Baez. I fulfilled the myth of Biru. I took all of the masters out of my house. Nesativ la Levi, if we're talking about Masarishog, la Gerli, asom amana, if we're talking about Masarani. 
Kechal mitzvosecha shed sinisani. I fulfilled every last mitzvah that you commanded me. Lo, I'm eating mitzvosecha. So Rav Salvechik, my friend, is that what do? Why is he doing? Vidu means confession. It says Rav Salvechik that this form known as Vidu Meisters is really the introduction to Vidu. And he says that confession is only possible if man is aware of his potential. If man doesn't realize how great he is, if he's down on himself, then there's no room for confession. He says, we confess that we have sinned. And on Yom Kippur, of course, we do so mercilessly. You know, 10 times over, we recite Vidu. But here, the Jew is boasting. They didn't even violate one prohibition with regard to Asif. Why is it called confession? The answer. Every tshuva, every repentance is predicated on the power within man himself. But at the same time, it's based on the, on the ability of each individual to a childless hidden spiritual powers. He has a true potential. And I know we have to finish soon. So I want just to share this with you. There's so much here. He's a following. Again, the first principle was the power of man to accuse himself. Secondary, most important primary principle is the ability of man to elevate himself, to find within himself boundless hidden spiritual powers. Man has to have faith in his ability to rise above all the circumstances, to overcome all the challenges. If man is not convinced of his own native powers and potential, then he can guilt, he can never repent, he can never want to change. He'll always excuse himself. If he looks upon himself as an impotent creature, then the position of the sinner is helpless. And here our salvation connects us back to Shira Shi. In the first chapter, Shlomo El declares, Shora Ani Venava, Benos Yushalayim. Black I am, and I am beautiful, the daughters of Jerusalem. What does this mean? Black and beautiful. Okay, some say black is beautiful. <laughs> Maybe that's true. But our salvation takes it a different way. He says, we have to see blackness. Blackness represents darkness. Darkness represents the failures of man. But we need Nava, we need the beauty. Nava ani benos yushalayim. Man has to declare that he can live as Nava within the accord of the will of, of the sovereign ruler, meaning the Rosh Hashem. We can live a life of sanctity and purity. Man is, and, and his power is manifest in that he can fulfill the will of God. And that's what we see here in the parish of Vimasras. Asisi kechala shetzivisam. will admit, if man will only acknowledge that he has tremendous unlimited potential, if we believe he's capable of doing, then ready to find fault in ourselves and try to improve and try to achieve what doing and achieve. So just to close with an ending, what we're able to see today is that Shira Shirin is a unique book. We can put it 23 and 1 on two sides of a, of, of, of a scale. It's Kodashi. And actually, because there's no we are called upon in Shira Shirin to live our lives, embrace all dimensions of our existence and elevate them. Each one according to his or her own ability, to a level of Kedusha, a level of sanctity. And that challenge is the challenge of Shira Shira. That's the challenge of Yitzhiya Mitzrayim and the Geula. That's the challenge of Shira Shira. You know, maybe it be his will that we all face this challenge, will encounter the world, embrace it in all its dimensions, and uplift it to the highest level. Came at some point.